side of the market. So we'll look at consumers, how consumers decide how much they want to buy, how they're affected by price. Next, we'll look at the supply side of the market. So then we'll look at firms, um, how they decide what goods they want to bring to the market, um, how price determines what quantity they'll want to, they'll want to um, supply. Then we'll get to the fun stuff. We'll put supply and demand together into a market so we can see what the equilibrium price will be, um, how the invisible hand encourages buyers and sellers to uh, reach the same amount. And then we'll look at shifts in the supply and demand curve and how that affects equilibrium. So how, how that's going to change the market. There's a lot of people in here that aren't business majors, so you really don't care about this. But if you're working for a company and you're trying to figure out how to price your goods, understanding supply and demand and understanding shifts in supply and demand are going to be really helpful. So the demand for, say, smartwatches. For some reason, the textbook loves smartwatches, as an example. What's that? Yeah, it's like every single chapter, there's like one or two examples. It's, I don't know if they got like advertising money from someone who makes smartwatches or something. I would make fun of them, but I would, I would put commercials in my class if someone paid me to. Or be like a NASCAR guy just like sponsored up here with like sport coat covers and stuff. I do it, it's money. Um, so how many smartwatches consumers want to buy? That's gonna be affected by the price of smartwatches. Obviously it's like, it's a good, it's cheaper. Like you'll buy more of it. Like price is a pretty big factor in how much people choose to buy and what they choose to buy. There's also, also other factors. So prices of other goods, your income, if that changes, things like that that are gonna affect your demand. And looking at the supply for smartwatches, or really for any good, how many smartwatches are producers willing to sell? That's obviously gonna be affected by the price of smartwatches. The more money they can get back, the more uh, products are gonna be willing to sell because of increasing costs. But there's other factors that are gonna to contribute to their decision for how many to produce. So again, there's prices of other goods that'll influence that, the cost of like supplies, and the, like the natural resources it takes to build, or I don't know, create, manufacture those products, a whole host of other things that we'll cover. So there'll be a lot going into what determines the price of a good or a service. And we'll build up from the demand side and the supply side, put them together and see, see how it works. So the model of the market we're looking at is um, what's called perfectly competitive. It's an assumption that doesn't always hold but in this case, it makes it, um, makes it easiest to do this analysis. So first, there's gonna be a lot of buyers and sellers. So in this ideal market, there's a lot of firms offering the good and there's a lot of people trying to buy. Because of that, you have strong competition. So um, firms can't just, say there's like one or two firms in the market, they don't have to compete against each other too hard. As you don't have many options to go to if you're a consumer, you're just stuck with those two. Um, if there's a lot, then they're going to be you know, trying to improve the product. They'll have to be more responsive to consumer demand. If other firms drop the prices, they'll have to drop prices. If other firms increase prices, they can increase prices. Next is all firms are selling identical products. So if we look at a market for smartwatches, we're going to assume that smartwatches are basically the same, that they do pretty much all the same stuff. Obviously that's not true in the real world for most products. But um, by doing this, we can, again, it increases the amount of competition in the market so that we can see how this process works a lot easier. And there's no barriers to new firms entering the market. So new firms can come in and compete um, and start offering the product. Again, this increases the amount of competition. Um, not, always true in the or not always true in practice, but in this theory just so that we can see how supply and demand actually works. So it's gonna be useful for analyzing these markets. So first is the demand side. Um, this is gonna be like how buyers behave, how they react to, to price changes, what that's gonna to do to the amount of a good or service they wanna buy. So we refer to the total demand as market demand. So that's all the consumers in a market. 
So if it's like a, a local restaurant, it's the LPG up here. Um, the market demand is going to be like the libretto in the surrounding area, like very small. But if you're looking at smartwatches, that's going to be like across like the whole world where people buy smartwatches. So the market demand is all the consumers for that good or service, um, however, however many that is, however like spread out they are. So this figure here on the left is called a demand schedule. It shows the relationship between the price of the product and the quantity that's being demanded. Here you have a price, a uh, dollar for the smartwatch, and then at several prices are decreasing. You have the quality demanded by consumers. So the price is 450. Consumers, in this case, are going to demand three million smartwatches. The price falls to 400. Consumers demand four million smartwatches. And then all the way down to 250. Um, 7 million consumers demand smartwatches. Notice as the price decreases, the quantity demand is going to increase. Um, think about in your own life, cheaper things are, the more willing you are to buy them. How many of those new weird goofy coffee drinks are you going to buy if they're $10 a piece? Not anymore, I can buy that much. Versus if they're two for five? Still not anymore. Well, not anymore, but that lower price, <laughs> would you have tried it if it was real expensive? Nope. Well, I'm a curious person, probably not. When things are cheap, you're willing to take that risk. Or when they're cheap, you're willing to buy more of them. Now we can uh, graph this demand schedule. Uh, demand schedules are kind of clunky to work with, but this graph provides us a nice visual. We have the price here, and we have the quality demand in here. Then our demand curve is sloping down. We just really plot all these points, and then use the line to connect them. In this case, we have the supply curve, or excuse me, demand curve sloping downward in a straight line. Um, that's not necessarily the case. It can be pretty much any shape. It can be like curved. It could be at different angles. Um, we're gonna work with straight ones like that just because it's easy to visualize. But just know that in markets it can be it can be however. So when we draw the demand curve, we assume, um, we use the Latin phrase caterus paribus, which means all else equal. So basically when we um, look at the relationship between price and quantity, we're going to assume that everything else is being held constant. So there's tons of other things going on in the world. Um, consumers tastes can change, um, the prices of other products could fall, uh, new product to be created, all these different things going on. We're going to assume none of that's happening, that literally it's just price and quantity that are changing. The reason we do this is just so it's easy to understand the effect of what's going on. But in this case, we're graphing the relationship between price and quantity. That's all we care about. You can see in the real world, uh, maybe whoever's making these smartwatches um, doesn't have the ability to increase production that much. So if they move from, say, 6 million to 7 million smart watches a week, maybe the quality drops because they have everyone working overtime like as fast as they can. Um, anyone watch Bob Burgers? Yes. Like you saw the episode where like the kids do the entrepreneur class and they like, make little wood chucks. Yeah. And they like, speed up, they start making them super fast and the quality like dips. I thought as soon as I like, mentioned that. Um, that's, if that happens, that's not holding everything constant. So we're assuming in this case that they can increase production all along that line without dipping quality, without any other changes going on. So the quantity demanded is the amount of good or service that a consumer is willing to buy um, at that given price. So with a price of $450, the quantity demanded is going to be 3 million smartwatches. At a price of $300, the quantity demanded is going to be 6 million smartwatches. And with this demand curve, in theory, anywhere on this line, 
current um, consumer digital device. Let's so say it's at like 425, it'll be between the two points. It'll be like 325. It's not just all those points that are listed, it's anywhere on the curve itself. So this brings us to the law of demand. Law of demand holds that um, if you hold everything else constant, the, when the price of a product falls, the quantity demanded of the product is going to increase. And when the price of a product rises, the quantity demanded of the product will decrease. So there's an inverse relationship going on. Again, with demand, this should be pretty intuitive because we're all consumers, we all buy a lot of stuff, so we're used to being on the demand side of the market. If you've ever bought, in, I don't know, if when there's a two-for-one sale, you bought two instead of just buying the one that you normally would have bought. Um, you wait till the end of the season to buy something that goes on sale. One of these was like three bucks, that's why I bought two of them. Yeah. You end up with that good deal, you're willing to, to buy more. Oops. Wow, I went way too far. Okay, so what's going on with the law of demand? There's two effects that are simultaneously happening um, when the price falls and consumers buy more, or vice versa. First is that consumers substitute towards a product whose, good is, whose price has fallen. As it becomes cheaper, people are willing to buy more of it, of that good. And also consumers have more purchasing power because something they were going to buy is now cheaper. It's as if their income increased. So it feels like they have more money to spend. And these two are going on at the same time. We have the definitions here. The substitution effects is a change in the quantity demanded for a good that results from a change in the price, making the good less expensive relative to other goods that are substitutes. So let's roll with this, this cheap flavored coffee thing. What are some of the substitutes for this cheap flavored coffee? Starbucks. Starbucks, a good flavored coffee? Cheapest coffee, bro. Yeah, so there's other, other brands of coffee, maybe energy drinks. Maybe like chocolate milk is like a sugary drink with that. The vanilla milk? Have you ever had vanilla milk? I have not. So pretending these actually taste good, a price drop in those relative to those other substitutes, we'll see more people demand this crappy chocolate drink. Now there's also the income effect going on. So the change in the quantity demanded of a good that results from the effect of a change in the goods price on the consumer's purchasing power. So because the price of this good is now lower than before, it's as if you have more money to spend. So you'll increase your consumption of that good, or you'd be more likely to consume that good. You guys have any questions about demand so far? Is that why there was the one for like a two for five? Because the like the price of them actually decreased, so they're helping by making more two for five that like the people were actually gonna buy more of it so they can Yeah. Some of it is making money, some of it is like just getting it off the shelves. Um, a lot of times like you go to the grocery store and you see they're running like the two for five or I don't know, ten for ten dollars, that kind of stuff. Those shelves are full compared to like the other ones next to it, and they're just trying to get out the old stock. So there's like two sides. It's either they're doing really good or really bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, at Rite Aid, where I work, um, like we still have a bunch of like summer stuff, but it right now it's 90% off because there's Christmas stuff in the back that we have to get out by the show. I was just going to ask how you can get Yeah, that's. Get stuff off the shelf. That was an ad for Rite Aid. Yeah, yeah. How, um, we're actually going to talk about that in a second. Not about candles, unless they're willing to pay me, in which case we can talk about candles the rest of the class. And we'll talk about things that shift the demand curve. So obviously price, you will move along the demand curve. As the price changes, let's say it drops from 450 bucks to 400 bucks, 
they're going to move along with the demand curve from three million to four million. So more than just price can change. And when something besides price changes, that will cause the entire demand curve to shift. So if you shift to the right, that's going to be an increase in demand. If you shift to the left, that's going to be a decrease in demand. So might be a little hard to read for you guys, but the, the curve in the middle is demand curve D1. The one to the right is D2. So you're going to shift from D1 to D2 if there's an increase in demand. If there's a decrease in demand, you're going to shift from D1 to D3, move to the left. And we said before, we're holding all things equal. Now this is when we're not holding all things equal. This is when we're allowing other things to go on besides changes in price. Because that's much more realistic for what happens in a market. Now that we've built the demand curve, we can talk about shifts in it. So if we stay at this initial price, Q1, this is where we originally, where the market demand was, at Q1. We shift the curve to the right if we increase it, this demand curve over here, the quantity of smartwatches demand is going to increase when the price stays the same. Likewise, if we decrease demand, we shift it to the left, even staying along that price, the quantity of demand is going to be much lower. So when we experience a shift in the demand curve, the quantity demanded is going to change even when the price doesn't change. So here's some of the variables that um, cause a shift in the demand curve and that influence market demand. The first is income. Obviously, how much consumers are able to buy is going to be a major role in what they choose to buy. The price of related goods, so the other things consumers can buy. Their tastes and preferences. The population and demographics. And the expected future prices. I'm going to skip ahead to... Um, changes in tastes and preferences. So Lindsay, why are they dropping the price 90% for um, summer goods? Because um, summer goods. And? And we need to get the right. It's almost like their their tastes are changing based on the season. Uh -huh. you got me there. So if consumers' tastes change, which they tend to do over time, they may buy more or less of a product. That's going to change whether their demand for the product. So if consumers become more concerned about eating healthy, it'll decrease the demand for fast food. Shift that demand curve to the left. But places like Whole Foods or Trader Joe's that sell healthy food or healthier food. The demand curve should shift to the right for them because people are now eating more healthy. It's the end of summer. People don't want to buy summer stuff anymore because pretty soon it's going to be snowing up here. That's going to shift their demand to the left. It's going to decrease their demand for a good. So if you're right, Ace, and the demand curve is shifted from here to here, they're going to be demanding a lot less than they were just like a month ago. So they're trying to do they're lowering the price to sell as many of those as they can. In this case, recoup, you know, whatever whatever money they can for what's sitting on their shelves. Get out the door so they can at least make some money back. There's plenty of different uh, changes in taste and preference that can happen. People are more concerned about safety in sports. So fewer people are watching the NFL. Again, they can be seasonal changes. Um, consumer, consumers in general, their tastes are changing now as more baby boomers are getting older. All right, so next. Changes in income of consumers. So there's two types of goods we should talk about. The first are normal goods. There's pretty much every good out there. Um, so basically demand is going to increase as people's income rises. 
the more money they have to spend, the more they're going to be willing to buy normal goods. So it's things like new clothes, restaurants, vacations. And if their income decreases, if there's a recession or they lose their job, um, their demand is going to decrease for those goods. Again, because it's relatively more expensive for them because they have less money to spend. Now there's another type of good, they're called inferior goods. So for inferior goods, your demand is going to increase when your income falls, so the exact opposite. And as your income rises, so you get a better job, make more money, your demand for them are going to decrease. So these are examples like secondhand clothing, ramen noodles, things that you may eat a lot of ramen noodles now, because you're in college, you don't have a regular income, or if you do, it's a very small income. When you graduate, hopefully you get a job, make some decent money, you don't have to eat ramen noodles anymore, you can eat better food. You can go out to eat at restaurants. I still buy a lot of clothing secondhand because it can be, it's a lot cheaper to buy sport coats secondhand, like if you know what you're looking for. Unfortunately, today I'm not wearing anything, anything secondhand. But the Evansburg Goodwill is a gold mine of weird stuff. I used to have a, a, a sweatshirt that said, Grandpa's my name, Spoils my game. I wear it all the time in undergrad. A little less funny now than when I grow up. Um, Salvation Army in Altoona is like Dermot's Where's that at? Um, so, it's at school, isn't it? No, it's the last Sam Club. And then it's like right up the hill. It's like its own light. Oh, up there on like Plank Road. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's its own light, and you turn and then it's like getting to the It's like coming. I'll have to try that one out. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, you can find some real funny stuff. You can also find some good stuff secondhand. But again, as your income increases, your demand for secondhand clothing is going to decrease. Uh, you got enough money you can spend on new clothing. And as you make more money, your demand for new clothing, this normal good, is going to increase. Right. So an increase in income. For normal good, for say new clothing, holding all the same people, if your income increases, shift the main curve to the right. Go so from D1 to D2. So at any price, say like right here, you can be with that line. Here, the initial curve, the point of demand is going to be like down here. And the new curve, the same place, is going to be out here. So the quality demand is going to increase as your income increases. Now for secondhand clothing, as your income increases, the exact opposite is going to happen. And you're going to see the demand curve shift to the left will decrease. But if, that's, if it stays at the same price, your, um, your consumer's willingness to consume is going to decrease. The quantity demanded is going to decrease. So we'll have fewer secondhand clothing being bought, more normal clothing being bought. Yeah, let's end there for today. We've got two minutes left. Let's start a new slide.